Welcome to season two of Hacking Hollywood. In this episode, we have Rev Holly. What's up, guys? Hey guys, thanks for joining me on Hacking Hollywood. Today's episode is a very special one. It marks the second season of Hacking Hollywood. And our first guest on the show is Rav. How you doing, Rav? Good, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Awesome, yeah. We're going to be talking about um, what it's like to be a local here in L.A., working in television and film. And Rav has some great experience with that. He's done a few other things in the past. So, um, Rav, why don't we just start off by uh, talking a little bit about your history, um, how you started in Texas, and then were you're a photographer, and then started getting involved in the bigger productions. Yeah, so in 2006, I got an offer uh, to move out to California and become an on-staff photographer for a sports agency, an MMA sports agency, which back in 2006, MMA was still in, in its infancy. Mm-hmm. So a company called MMA Agents paid to move me out here. And I spent the next decade pretty much working as a photographer, a working photographer, until that's gotten to be an oversaturated market. And I ended up having to close my studio that I'd had for seven years in downtown Long Beach and start consol- consolidating things mm-hmm. because I, my studio rent was like 3300 a month. So there was times when I didn't even think about it. You know, when money's good, you don't even think about it. But then as things dwindled and I lost the Getty contract and some other things, it just became too much. It became a burden to be able to, to be sweating having to make that rent every month. So um, I started looking at something else to do. And at my age, it's not that easy just to jump out of one profession into another one. And I'd spent over a decade building my reputation and career in L.A. as a photographer, a commercial photographer. Luckily, I do have, I had worked as a photographer with some pretty famous people. And one of those people is a good friend of mine. And he started asking me, well, what would you really want to do if you could do something else? And I was like, well, you know, I moved out here. When I moved out here, I wanted to be a set photographer and, you know, do like movie posters and that kind of thing. And that was a door that had never been opened to me. And he said, well, you know, I have a really good friend who's a really famous producer, or not famous producer, but a really popular producer in Hollywood. And he's starting on a new show. Would you like to go and talk to him and maybe he can get you on that show? And I was like, for sure. So he set up the interview and the guy's name was, the producer's name is Brad Simpson. I went in and met with Brad. He's done movies like World War Z and all kinds of stuff. He's been in the business since the 90s. And I went in and interviewed with him. He's from Arkansas. I'm from Texas. We seemed to hit it off at that time and I jumped on the show. Super with cool. no production experience, production assistant experience at all. And that was the first taste that you had yeah. as being as a, a PA? Per, as a PA. Oh, okay. I had Production actually system. worked on the sets of CSI Miami and a ABC show called Life on Mars. I shot the pilot. I shot all the stills for all the advertisement and the promotion for the pilot and their EPK. And then um, I had planned on being a set photographer. But um, to get into the local 600, as you know, was... It's like six thousand yeah. dollars to pay your dues to get into that thing, and at the time I had the money, but I actually decided to buy equipment instead. Mm-hmm. You know, you always you're always weighing one or the other, and I was like, well, I need the equipment. If I'm going to get into it, I need the equipment. And once I bought the equipment, I didn't have the in anymore to get back into the local six hundred. So yeah. that dried up pretty quick. I thought once I invested in the equipment, I'd be able to jump on the jump in and. That, that door had closed. Oh, wow. so. well, do you, looking back at when you first started doing photography, was there a certain project or a certain series of photos that you think um, got you that MMA contract? Or was how did you first go from you know an amateur to starting to book gigs, you know, starting to build your... Well, this is actually a pretty interesting story, and I'll try to consolidate it because it's kind of long, but I was just a guy sitting on my... In my I was a guy in my home office in Dallas, Texas. I was just this guy. I was Nobody knew who I was, but I'd become like... When I started my photography uh, in 99, and I decided I'd been a photographer bef- like seven years before that, but just like very rudimentary or very amateur. I mean, I wasn't, I was far from professional. And so I never billed myself or called myself a professional photographer, but I did hang out with a few professional photographers. Uh, one was Stephen Elliott Hendricks, uh, a guy in Dallas that had been to television broadcasting school like way back, and he had worked in television. So, and he had become a photographer. So he gave me a lot of pointers and I was on some of his sets and some of his shoots. The thing that really jump-started my career is one, I bought a digital SLR. 
And as far as I know, I was probably the first digital SLR owner in Dallas as a professional photographer that I bought in 99, which was a DCS 315 Kodak <laughs> before Canon or Nikon, either one had a DSLR out. So I started shooting my kids' sports. And then in 2001, Nikon released the Nikon D1, which was the same as my Nikon F5 35 millimeter film body. So I jumped on that camera and it was five grand. Oof. I bought it and the, the, the Kodak was 3,500. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I invested the money at the time because I had it and then uh, it just went from there because I, like, I think that camera was maybe like 2.7 megapixels or something like that. Wow. <laughs> so, you, but you could still get an 8 by 10 out of it. But, you know, what people still fail to realize is, Unless I, you know, I still shot film if I needed to do enlarge, enlargements. Like if I did a 16 by 20 bridal portrait or something like that, that mm -hmm. was going to be like in a 20 by 24 frame mm -hmm. on a matte frame, I would do like a, uh, I would shoot it, I would shoot that film. I would shoot those with film. But anything else, I mean, it's, you're looking at still, it was still web stuff. Yeah. So you didn't need a lot of meta megapixels. It's the same nowadays. I mm -hmm. mean, you think about your camera, there are eight megapixels or whatever. 90% of the stuff, you're throwing it up on social media. Mm -hmm. Maybe 95%. When's the last time you printed something out? So it was the same in those days. I mean, prints were more prevalent in those days, but still, a lot of the stuff I was doing was built. I started building websites, and I used that camera for going out shooting my clients' photos because that's how I really got into it is my, my step aunt and uncle hired me to do the website for their um, RV park down close to Austin on Lake Buchanan. And I'd called Austin and talked to three or four photographers in the local Austin area, trying to get them to go down to the lake and do photos. And I was paying them 300, I offered them $300. And this was back in the nineties, which would be like 900 today mm. in Dallas. And, uh, every one of them flaked out. None of them, none of them did it. Wow. And I had, I had, uh, I can't remember how much I charged, but anyway, I invested that money into the, that I made for my aunt and uncle cause they paid me and I invested that money into that first, Kodak camera hmm. and then that kind of so I went down there took pictures and that kind of jump-started everything super cool so, yeah. and there's been a few points in your life where um, you've either had to pivot or you've decided to pivot um, going from photography to PAing or you know different circumstances in your life um, I think having that flexibility is kind of one of those characteristics I would describe as like almost necessary to be in the film industry um, could, maybe you could share your experience on that it's being a freelancer at all. Mm -hmm. If you're not on staff, people don't understand this. They hear freelance all the time. And the thing about being freelance, what people don't understand, or I think they I think they have an idea about it, but they don't completely understand it. And the thing about freelance is you're, you're employed from job to job. So if you're not on a job, you're unemployed. And as you know, you know, when, th when it's, you know, in film, or the, in, te in television and film, and when things are in season, you're working all the time. But when the season dries up, when pilot season was just over, there's nothing. Like right now, there's not a whole lot going on. So you're just unemployed. So you really have to be able to uh, learn to finance your life and not splurge too much. And, you know, you I don't necessarily think we're frugal with money because we spend on a lot of stuff on equipment and stuff like that but you definitely always have to know what your expenses have an idea what your expenses really are when you're in, in the off season when you're not working and it's the same as a photographer so for years when I was a photographer um, even when I had my studios I moonlight I moonlighted as a bouncer and a door guy in downtown Long Beach. I worked at a little bar called at Shannon's on uh, Pine Street, which is at Broadway and Pine in uh, Long Beach. And I did that for four years mm -hmm. while I, you know, and and it was, you know, were a deal where you got paid and it helped supplement my other job mm -hmm. of being a photographer. So if I wasn't, if I didn't have a photography job, I knew I'd be working Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, you know, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. And I'd make, a, enough to pay my rent and stuff so I didn't have to worry about that okay. and that's the main reason I did that job and in LA which people that are watching this that are not from LA that is LA in a nutshell is everybody has more than one job pretty much everybody's doing something to make sure that they're making their rent and then they're doing their passion project whether it's acting or art or whatever it is photography uh, DJing, musicians, whatever you're doing, almost everybody has a 
as a uh, base job, whether it's being a waitress or whatever it is, you know, if it's a, you know, uh, waiter or, you know, there's lots of things out there that you can do. And I chose being a, like a door guy um, because I was pretty good at that at the time. Yeah, I think that's a very popular thing to have, if, like that st- stability and that kind of baseline. Um, for me, it was kind of real estate in a sense. Right. And, and that kind of developed my whole side business, which I won't get into here, but um, but you're still in. You're still in doing that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still kind of pursuing that and seeing um, where that's going to take me. It's it's nice to be kind of untraditional as far as work goes and not have the same job and do the same thing over and over and over again. <laughs> that's a deal that um, you know a lot of people that don't are not really familiar with California or Southern California, I should say, and probably Northern too. When you get up around San Francisco, but it's all techie and Silicon Valley and computer stuff and IT stuff up there. But down here, it's the film industry. It's the multi-billion dollar business. And people, you know, we're both from Dallas or from Texas. We're from Texas. So we know those two different markets. So people in Texas generally, a couple of the differences is, you know, they're all about getting married and, you know, they're always, most people are hitched up. In LA, um, most people are single. Most people in the LA, it's a hustle. It's a, I mean, it's like in Dallas, you get a job, you pick a field. Like when I was in Dallas, it was refrigeration. I went to the office, you know, I had a nine to five. It was just an everyday job, everyday grind. Out here, a lot of people have a lot of free time because they have all of these different things that they're working on that are generating money. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? But, you know, I may not work for, I may not work for a week, but then I might work a couple of days and make as much money as I was making in Dallas in a week and two days what I was, you know, here, Mm -hmm. or sometimes more, you know, I mean, I've worked on a couple of projects in Vegas where my day rate was, you know, upwards of a thousand dollars. And some people don't make that in a week. So, you know, it's, it's it's a different, it's a whole different animal out here Mm -hmm. and you've got to be out here to actually experience it. So I watch, so I'm, you know, I'm a social media whore. So I watch all the time on social media, people posting stuff on social media that are in different markets, smaller markets, Nashville, you know, uh, Houston, Dallas, uh, uh, Atlanta. And they think because they have an idea of how things work out there that they can just hop out here and just hit the ground running. And Mm -hmm. I'm, I hate to tell you, it does not work like that. I tell everybody that wants to move out here, give yourself a five-year window. Give yourself a five-year window to really find your stride and start really getting up and moving. Because you got to network and you got to meet people when you first move out here. And I think you've been out here about five years right mm-hmm. now, right? Yeah, just over. So you could mm-hmm. probably attest that you're really finding your stride right now. You know the people, you have the contacts, you're not worrying about not knowing the people. And, and you That's know how that anxiety sets in when you don't know the people to contact or how to get work and those kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just, I would personally describe it as like you have one year to sink or swim. And then from year one to year three, you're really like sinking in your contacts. And year three is, for me at least, was the tar- time where I determined whether I wanted to stick it out here or go back home. I think that's kind of another like uh, pivotal moment of like deciding I'm going to stick it out. I like being in L.A. <laughs> I like doing that thing. Um, and then, yeah, now that I've hit year five, I think it's a, a lot of that just feeling comfortable and not worrying about where the next job's coming, right. you know, and having enough contacts and enough different things so when you switched from being a photographer to becoming a production assistant um what were some of the strengths that you brought as a photographer and what were some of the weaknesses um knowing what you knew in your background and um stuff that might have you stuck your neck out too far or maybe stuff that was uh cohesive and and the same you know as you know most production assistants are most of them are in their 20s Mm -hmm. and then there's a few in their 30s but you don't find them too many you don't find too many production assistants that are that are they're my age so it was it was weird for me because i had done i had directed a couple of music videos and i had had my own sets but i had no idea how a real set worked right. i had done a lot of low budget stuff of my own and uh, well not even low budget but compared to like hollywood standards low budget wasn't multi-million dollar projects I was working on. It was thousands of dollar projects I was working on and putting together and producing uh, with my company, Rav Media Group. And so when I got to a professional film set, I thought I would have a big advantage. 
And it really threw me for a loop because there's a whole lingo. I mean, truck drivers on CB radios have a lingo, but I mean, there's a whole lingo in, in the film industry that if you don't know the lingo, you're lost. And when you put that earpiece in and they start talking in that lingo, you don't know what anybody's talking about. It's almost like a foreign language. Yeah. So that really took me back because I did not, nobody had told me that. I had no idea that there was going to be all of this film. I don't it, I don't know exactly how to explain it other than lingo. Mm -hmm. It's just a terminology that is used in the film industry that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to pick up on anybody that's green. I've had production assistants walk in a set and tell me that they know this and they know that and they know this and they know that. And within five minutes, you know, because they don't know what the lingo is. Yeah. You can, you know, you can, you can give them something like, uh, go to crafty and get the director, uh, coffee, two sugars and one cream. And they're in the, in the, you don't hear anything. Mm -hmm. And you're like, did you copy? Hello? No, did you copy? <laughs> and then, you know, and then you go find them or they come find you and they're like, what, what's crafty? And you're like, mm -hmm. you know, which everybody pretty much, I think knows what crafty is, but that's just a, I mean, there's a lot of things like that, like the lunchbox. Go to the lunchbox. What's the lunchbox? Go to the honey wagon. What's the honey wagon? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's go to costumes. Okay, what's that? And all those are terms that like you could hear in a class yes. or you could hear in film school. But the reality is, unless it sinks into your mind, like, and you see it and it it visualize, it's it's really hard to identify what those terms are. And I think that was one of the hard hardest challenges for me at first too. Is yeah, the vocab and just knowing the same things you just said but there's dozens of others if not hundreds of others of terms that i didn't know <laughs> yeah even so. just a lock up i mean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just a little simple stuff um and the funny thing is you went to film school mm -hmm. so you had some idea of what you were getting yourself into i had no idea mm -hmm. absolutely no idea i was lost and so that was really hard for me that was one of the hardest things for me is because I had been in control of my own five or six employees at one time doing my sets. Yeah. And then all of a sudden to be in a mix of 60 to 100, 120, 30 people crew and having no idea, you know, like I remember walking out on the lot and being given an instruction to go give like uh, something to electrical. And I'm just going, where is electrical on this lot? I had no <laughs> idea. It's in a truck. You yeah, know? yeah. And if you don't know that, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't know there's a there's a camera truck, electrical truck, and they're, they're all on the lot. Mm -hmm. If you're on even if you're shooting on a lot, those those trucks are on the lot somewhere. You gotta go find your, your truck. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so uh, you know, when they said electrical, you know, I was look, looking around and I was like, Okay, well there's medical, so where's the electrical <laughs> building? You know, so those kind of things yeah. are it really threw me for a loop and it was, you know, and it's like I tell anybody, I mean, I've seen a couple of really young PAs come on. Uh, Radar brought one on when we were on a horror story and it was his first day. He had never been on, had never been on a set. So he was like, you know, and I was like, yeah, just, you know, slow down, just take it all in. Just try to remember, be a sponge, learn everything that you can. You're not going to learn it overnight. And I remember at the end of the day, he come up to me and he was this real cool black kid. And he's like, so, He's like, Rev, how long does it take to get, how long will it take me to get like you? I said, dude, I, there, I said, sometimes a director calls me and tells me to something. I still don't know what she's talking about. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's always stuff you'll be learning yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. But I said, give yourself a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I think it takes about 24 months and you need about, I say you need 50 to 100 days on a set before yeah. you're going to get your, get your bearings and mm -hmm. really be comfortable with what's going on mm -hmm. and how things are working. And you know as well as I do, even knowing what we know, we still screw up. You know, well, they'll tell us to go do something, and I'm like, wait a minute, I think that was over there. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've, you know, I've like I've been told to go grab talent in the golf cart and end up at the wrong stage. You know what I mean? Like, wait, we're not on that stage. And, you know those kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely. It's that weird tension, and especially when you're first getting started in the business. Um, I remember those days too of, of like, oh, I'm there. I want to be there. I want to, you know. But you just got to realize that it's an ever, never ending uh, learning curve, so to speak. And you're always going to learn something, and there's always going to be something different. Which once once that sinks into your mind, that like you're not going to ever know everything. <laughs> um, I think you'll have a different attitude and a different mindset, and I. 
I think that's one of the things that I like about this show is um, it kind of taps into that learning from um, the big productions and then applying that to the smaller productions. And um, I've been in the same boat where I've been on sets where I've been kind of in charge of everything and running the set. But then I've also been on the big shows where I'm that one little speck, in, you're one little speck in the wheel. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting to be on both sides. Um, and so my hope with Hacking Hollywood is to to look at the big stuff and then figure out ways to apply that knowledge and uh, break it down and do a similar system. But instead of 120 people or 150 people on set, there's 12 or 15 right. people on set. You know, um, which is kind of fun. So I think I think you got a good thing here because I think it's uh, there's. There's not a lot of information. That was my biggest thing is when I got my first PA job, I looked all over the internet and there really wasn't a lot of inf- really good information that really delved into like what you would really need to know, mm-hmm. you know, like the basics. So you just had to kind of learn it. And, you know, one thing I do know is uh, sometimes you'll find another nice PA. They'll kind of take you by the elbow and go here. This is what you need to do. This is what they're talking about. But usually, as a PA, you have so much responsibility that the last thing you want is to be responsible for a greenhorn or somebody else. And you don't have to be. Nobody, The director hardly or anybody's hardly going to ever ask you to be. Sometimes a second will come up and go, hey, this is so-and-so, they're new, can you kind of show them around a little bit? But you're in charge of them until they call you to do something and then they're on their own. So you really have to be able to somebody that's a self starter. You have to take initiative. You have to learn. You can't be, um, what's the word? Not shy, but you can't be, um, you have to be a go getter. You have to be somebody that, that takes initiative and gets out there and learns. You yeah. can't be, um, timid. Mm-hmm. If you're timid, you'll never make it in the film. You'll never make it on a film crew. I remember a young PA coming on, a girl, and she kept asking crew. Like she would like stop like the grips and the cameras and you know and ask, Hey, what is what do I need to do here? What do I need to do there? And they're like, We we don't know. I mean, people don't understand that there's a nucleus of every different crew. You have your grips, you have your camera, you have everybody production, and they work as their own team. So it's a big misconception, I think, when people walk onto a new set, you can just ask anybody and they'll be able to tell you what you need to do. No, they have no idea what you need to do. Yeah. You need to find somebody in your production or in your team that's going to give you some direction. And most of the time, they're busy. So you got to find out what you need to do. Mm-hmm. So it's really important to have, I think, a real strong relationship with your second AD. Because I think your second AD is pretty much where you need to go to to find your information. Because a lot of times, they'll be in the AD trailer. And if you're lost and can't figure something out and another PA can't direct you, you can always find your second AD and ask them what's going on. Yeah. Another thing is using your radio. That's a big thing that I still have problems with sometimes is because I think my feet's faster than the radio and it's not. You can just call on the radio. But then there's some times that I don't want to go, hey, go to three or whatever. So I'll just walk and find somebody so I can have that face to face. But I've had second seconds like throw a fit at me going, Rab, use your radio. Stop walking all over the stage when you can just call and ask. Yeah, it's a weird balance of like, because when you're on the radio, you're taking up time. Right. From the first primarily because that's their radio, right? At the same time, you're right, it's absolutely more efficient and that's what they're for. You're supposed to communicate yeah. via radio. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting balance. Um, one of my biggest frustrations with new PAs is of overuse of the radio right. too, you know? Um, and, and Especially once they start figuring out the terminology. They mm-hmm. want to be on the radio all the time. Or a sentence yeah. that takes 10 Wait, words when it should yeah, take four yeah. you know I'm, I'm the world's worst at that still <laughs> i'll get i'll start to say something and i'll get lost in exactly oh, no. what i was gonna say and then oh, like, no. oh god how do i wrap this up really quick uh-huh. yeah. yeah that's yeah. huge too and that's that's a big thing that's another thing you know there's little the, there's those little little things like that that you don't know that you're not supposed to be carrying a conversation on on the radio right you're supposed to say what you got to say and get off mm-hmm. is the mm-hmm. fewer words you can use the better it is yeah um you know, I've been reprimanded for saying copy that. I had a bad habit of going copy that. And, and if you get on any film crew, you'll hear copy that all day long. And I had, I heard that a first AD asked not to have me back on a show because I continuously said copy that. And she actually came on the radio and reprimanded me saying, hey, we don't need that. And nobody knew what she was talking about because I'd said, I was told to do something. I said, copy that. And then she came on and said, 
we don't need the bat. And I was like, I didn't even think it was from, I was like, what? And then somebody else said, oh, we don't, you don't want the PAs responding? And then it be turned into this whole, yeah, she's like, I want them responding, but I don't want them saying copy that. We don't need the that, just say copy. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a habit for me. Yeah. And that's how delicate things can be on a film. Because your first AD is the boss on that set right under the director, but the first AD controls everything, which is the first assistant director. And if the first assistant director doesn't want you back on a set, you won't be back. Yeah. And I've been through that. So it sucks. And just one little word. One little thing. Yeah. That word. Because I said that. And then I mm -hmm. tried to get out of it, tried to get And I still work on it. You'll, we worked together the other day. You don't hear me saying copy that anymore. I'll go copy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I got myself out of that. It's interesting. Like, it seems like it's not a big deal. And, like, in hindsight, like, when you're removed from the situation, you have a different kind of mentality. But in the moment, and being a, I've been a first as well, if that is what bothers me that day... <laughs> then you can't concentrate on what you're trying to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. So there's definitely yeah. two sides of it. But that's interesting. Because you're trying to co you're trying to concentrate on what you need to be doing. And mm -hmm. that, that is like a wrench in your will. Just, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your mind is not focused where it needs to be. I totally yeah. understand. Yeah. I mean, I totally get it. It just sucks that it was a habit. And, you know, it's those things that... Um, but we, but you know, that's one of the great things about people, you know, like nobody really came to me and told me because it was kind of kept not a secret, but you know, it was a, you know, it was just all of a sudden I wasn't, I've been working on the show every day. And then all of a sudden I'm not working on the show very much. And I was like, Hmm, so what's going on here? And then, so I got a hold of the second and I said, so did I do something to make the first mad? And she wouldn't tell me, but then I started remembering the, that and kind of putting it together. And I was like, yeah. Oh Yeah. And then I, I got back on um, a show when that first day, I worked again when that first day you did wasn't there. They I, they asked me back, and so I asked one of the PAs, and they're like, yeah, I guess they got mad because you were saying copy that all the time. I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. I knew it. It's interesting, like, the dynamics of different personalities and working with different people, but also, like, because we're PAs um, at that level, like you said before, the first CD is in charge, so they kind of get what they need, what they want, you know, so. Oh, for sure. That's one of those instances where you take nothing personally, like you're, like you just explained. And yeah, it's, it's you just have to pick up and move on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a hard lesson too of of the business. <laughs> oh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie, it sucked. Yeah, I was really enjoying my time on that show, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, it just went by the wayside really quick. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, what are some of the other characteristics that you think um, taking nothing or that's not really characteristics, but kind of one of those phrases, take nothing personal. Are there any characteristics of someone that would be more likely to succeed or maybe some other things like that that would give somebody an advantage? Well, I think the number one thing is you really have to be in love with what you're doing. Uh, you have to be in love with doing it because it's really long days. And a lot of, you know, most people work like an eight-hour day. We have 10-hour minimums. And most of the time, it's way more than 10 hours. Or a lot of times, it's way more than 10 hours. I don't think I've ever been on a show where we wrapped every day for a week 10 hours. It's usually more around 14, sometimes 16. Uh, you know, I've done 16-hour days five days a week for, you know, a couple of months. Yeah. You know, I've had a 19-hour day. I think you probably have, too. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, it's you really have to be dedicated and really enjoy what you're doing to survive it mm. uh, and you, or you won't. But the one thing about that is those long days, I think it make it, I think those long days make it easier for you to learn. I think it speeds up. Cause I think if you, if we worked like a regular eight or nine to five, let's say, I think it'd probably take you four or five years to become a decent PA instead of a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the time is amplified, so to speak, because we work so much and uh, better pretty quick. When you um, first started PAing, was there anything that was different than you expected? It was all different than I expected. That was one of the crazy things about it is because everybody out there in TV land, or that's not in TV, in the direct TV land, but watch TV or movies or anything, everybody I think has an idea of the way a film set works. Didn't, didn't you? Well, yeah. you went to school, but so you had a little bit of cheat, a little cheating there, but... If you've never been on a professional film set, like I actually had this grandiose idea that I had a pretty good idea of how everything worked. 
And I worked on a, I walked on a film set the first day, and I was completely lost. Mm. I had no idea how anything worked. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, there was like a time when I was walking across the stage, and I was like, one of the other PAs are going, and I'm like, what? And they're like, you're walking into the camera, you're walking into the shot. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> you know? Because I just was so lost in yeah. what was going on, and that's another thing that I'll touch on again is I expected somebody to just take me by the hand and go i'm no or i'm rav no i'm going to be training you for mm -hmm. the next two weeks so you know what you're doing it doesn't work that way man you were literally on your own you have to figure it out yourself yeah. nobody's going to take you by the hand and teach you what you need to do and every other profession i've ever been in you have training you'll go in for an orientation you'll have training you know, even when I worked at Arby's when I was a kid, you know, in high school. I mean, like the first two weeks I had to go to work at the same time as somebody else that was training me. They taught me how to work the fry machine. They taught me how to do, you know, whatever I needed to do, you know. And on a professional film set, you're left to your own vices. Mm -hmm. You have to figure it out. That's and cool. that's why you really have to be, you can't be timid because when I first started, I would be given a task that I would have no idea how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I would just be like okay like what am i supposed to do they tell me to do something and you're supposed to be very very efficient when you're given a task to get that task done <clears throat> so you really have to you know it would be a deal where i would stand there behind the stage on the lot and go oh my god what am i supposed to do i have no <laughs> idea what i'm supposed to go mm -hmm. do and so that's when i would call my second and say hey katie can you get a two she would get a two and i'd say hey they asked me to do like uh, distro i don't know what that is <laughs> could you give me a could you give me an idea what i'm supposed to do and she would go yeah rav just come to the trailer i know exactly what you need to do so mm -hmm. i'll get, come to find out that's exactly where i needed to go to get the distro was from my second ad mm -hmm. at the ad trailer so she had called set and said i have distro we'll get somebody to come get it and pick it up and go distribute it and distro is just short for dis distribution yeah and so those kinds of things so once they call you, you really have to figure out the right channels to find out exactly what you need to do if you don't know what to do. You can't just stand there and go, oh, no, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to hide until maybe somebody else gets the job or something because mm -hmm. they will find out. And I've had PAs that do that, that, you know, they're given a job and they're like, hey, did you see where he went? He was supposed to go do so-and-so and I haven't seen him, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's because they just don't know what they're doing and they get scared and just kind of disappear. And then you'll see them reappear. You know, at a, at a later date, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, where have you been? That's funny, man. Before we got together, I asked you to come up with a list of frequently asked questions. So we're going to kind of go through that. Um, but yeah, so one of the one we kind of talked about this already, so you can kind of abbreviate on it. But um, how did you first get into the business? I get asked this question all the time, mm -hmm. even through social media, my Facebook, on my YouTube channel, everything. People will ask me, how do you get into the business? And there's maybe three to four different avenues, but I think the most, the two most popular probably are exactly how we got in the business. I actually think the number one way to get into the business is knowing somebody mm -hmm. that's in the business. Yeah. They can vouch for you and get you on a set. Because like I said, you're not trained, you're not going to know what you're doing, so nobody wants you on the set. Nobody wants somebody that doesn't know what they're doing on the set. You're more viewed as a liability than somebody that is a featured part of the team until you learn what you're doing. But if you have somebody that can vouch for you, that can get you on the set, that has a lot of clout, people will bend to even knowing who you know. And that's kind of what was lucky for me and that I knew somebody that was high up in the entertainment industry and they hooked me up with a producer that was high up in the entertainment industry and they're like, hey, help this guy, you know. And nobody like took me by the hand and helped me, but it helped me get my foot in the door and get on a set. The second way is exactly how you did it, is go to film school, move out to LA and find some kind of apprenticeship in some studio. And there's if you'll work for free, but then the other thing you have to understand is there's tons of people clamoring to get that position. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a... Uh, it's just like being an actor, uh, you know, in auditioning. How often do you get to talk to celebrities? 
So this is a big question that I get. I'll get like, do you ever see the celebrities when you're working on a film? Do you ever get the going? Do you ever get, are you ever in contact with the celebrities? Who do you know? Who have you seen? That question to me is a little, uh, it kind of baffles me because say for instance, I was working on uh, American Horror Story two seasons ago when Lady Gaga was on there. Yeah, she's there. Anytime she's on set, we're to get, we're, she's there. We're there. Now, do I go up and bug her all the time? No, as a PA, you do not do that. You don't latch on to talent. Nobody does, uh, except for the PA that's in charge of first team. But then that's their job, is to be in charge of the principal cast or the cast or whoever they're in charge of. So, but do we see them? Yeah. Have I sh- I've shared a golf cart with Lady Gaga more than one time. You know what I mean? And I still, if I see her on the lot or something, she waves, I wave back. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, Stephanie, I mean, it's like, yeah, we see the celebrities all the time if they're in that show. If we work with them daily. It's so interesting, too, how, um, yeah, when I go back home and I talk to people and they're, oh, did you meet so-and-so? And they're excited about this person, that person. It's like, yeah. But when we're on set and we're doing our thing, we have to treat them like we treat everybody else. It's, you know, just normal conversations and, hey, how you doing? You know, we're not besties with anybody. <laughs> we're not, you know, we might hear about their family or vice versa, like, those kind of conversations but um in reality it's it's like any other coworker in a sense of that of that you know it's it's that's a, that's a that's a great analogy but mm-hmm. that was one of the things that for me was a huge bonus stepping on a set you asked me earlier and so i this comes to mind is because i'd already worked with several celebrities and some you know one of the most famous people in the world was the one that got me the you know the the interview with a producer so I already knew celebrities that already been around celebrities. So I'd already had those surreal feelings of, you know, sitting at a table with celebrities and going, wow, how did I get here? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd already been through that and I have celebrities that are friends. So it just wasn't a big deal to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I will say, I think maybe because of my age, I have, I do have some I've, that I've met that I've become friends with, you know, to on a personal level, like we have phone numbers and stuff, but we don't hang out all the time, but yeah. I know them, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's like kind of- Kenneth Choi, he was on, uh, he was on OJ, he was the judge, he was Judge Ito, and he worked on 911 as well, and so I know Kenneth, Kenneth, is a, he's a great guy. Uh, on Horror Story, uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. had a house party for the whole crew at his house, so, you know, uh, sometimes when we would rap on OJ, we would all go out to the bar, or not all, but you know the PAs and a few of the cast. So, like uh, David Schwimmer from Friends, was he would go, and you know we would hang out for a little while because we're all friends. I mean, you become like kind of family, but you don't hound the cast. You're not, you know, if you want to get thrown off a set or not asked back, that's the best way to do it mm-hmm. is being around the cast when you're not supposed to be because you always have something to be doing. And it's not sitting over there chatting up the cast or even I've seen PAs make that mistake even at lunch. You know, we'll be having lunch, uh, you know, and we'll be out on location during, uh, you know, during lunch. And the cast will come up to get their food and a PA goes up there and just attaches, gets attached to one of the cast and tries to go have lunch with them and stuff like that. And it just. It looks bad on the entire crew. Mm-hmm. You're never told not to do it, but you shouldn't have to be told not to do it. Yeah. So it's one of those things that can really, right away, it, it's a red flag if, if a PA starts doing that. Mm-hmm. And I've seen I've seen it with background. Background actors are the worst. Yeah. I've seen it with back BG a lot. And hopefully you're going to do some BG, yes. some background actor videos in the yes. future. Yes, there will be um, hopefully a whole slew of, of background acting videos and um, I work with background actors pretty often. I was on Silicon Valley, the guy in charge of background there, and there's been other shows like that. So um, background often have a bad reputation on set with the crew, but at the same time, there's a lot of great background actors that I've worked with that are very professional, that know their stuff. So, um, yeah, it's just like anything else. You, you can have a certain group of people within background actors that... Um, set a bad example for the rest of the background. And I think I think another thing that we should probably clarify when we talk about being PAs, <clears throat> there's 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 on staff PAs, and then there's people that do what I do pretty much, and that's day play. And so 
on staff PAs, you have different categories. You have a BG PA that's in charge of background. You have a first team PA that's in charge of taking care of the principal cast, whoever the stars are on that show. It's their job to make sure they get to and from set, from their trailers, if we're on location, they get them into a van, get them through hair and makeup. They're their babysitter to take care of them and to get them where they need to be. Then you'll have a roamer, which is a lot of times, which is what I'll do if if I'm a day player, I'll end up getting that job to roam so the other staff PAs can have other things to do. And then you have you have office PAs that set up in the office. Who else do we have? You have first team, BGPA. And a BGA PA is, is basically there just to take care of the background. Make sure mm-hmm. all the background actors get their vouchers. They get to set. They know what their penalties are. They know what their bumps are. Or, you know, all those things. Yeah, radio PA. Oh, yeah, radio mm-hmm. PA. Your walkie PA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or... Sometimes, not all the time, there's a key PA, yeah. um, which generally has the most experience. It seems like the key PA position is really going away these days, though. It's, it's a pretty weird rare. thing. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't yeah. happen as often, but yeah, it's very interesting. Um, you kind of talked about this a little bit, but yeah, so day player versus a freelancer. I mean, sorry, day player versus a staff PA. They're both freelancers, technically, but yeah, it's a good good description of each. Yeah, um, but a staff PA. When you're a staff PA, you actually you're you're on the staff. You're there every single day. You're going to be on the call sheet every day because you have a full time position on that show, yeah. on that production. Mm-hmm. And as a as a day player, you could be there when you're usually there one day gone the next. Or they'll tell you, uh, hey, we have one of our PAs has got to be out for three days. Can you cover for them? So you go in for two or three days. If they're having big production days off the lot out on location and they need you know if they're filming in one neighborhood for a week you may be there all week every Mm -hmm. day because they they need extras or they need additionals for those days yeah that's one thing being a day player is you can never you can never just like when i was doing the uh the copy copy that thing i mean you can never think that you have your foot in the door and you're going to be their go-to additional and another thing is i've worked on productions where They'll have you as an additional for a couple of weeks and then just want somebody else. Mm-hmm. They'll just switch out. Mm-hmm. Not, not that you've done anything wrong or they just want fresh blood. You just look at the call sheet. You never know from one day to the next if you're there until the call sheet comes out. I've had seconds call me on the radio and go, hey, Rav, are you available tomorrow? Yeah, I'm available. Okay, great, great, great. Call sheet comes out. I'm not on it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm already thinking, okay, well, I'm, I'm booked up tomorrow. So, you know, cool. Call sheet comes out and you're not on it. Yeah. It's got somebody else's name, so you can't take those things personally either. You just hurt my feelings. I was like, oh man, what did I do? Did I do something wrong? <laughs> mm-hmm. and you just got to understand. Sometimes they just want to bring in somebody else or somebody else on the crew knows a PA and that mm-hmm. PA is trying to get a few days and yeah. you know it's the way it's the way the film industry works. Yeah, it's another little secret I have that I'll let everybody know about. Um, when I'm working, because I also work a little bit in camera department and. Um, I shoot and edit and do other stuff too. Um, when I have one of those camera positions, when I have a cancellation, I still charge a cancellation fee, which is usually half of my day rate. Um, but as a PA, I actually don't get to do that very often, no. <laughs> if at all. So, if at all, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Um, let's see here. How much does a freelancer make? As a PA? Not, That's, not very much. Right. I mean, yeah. it's it's the pay is not great. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can work as a photographer or on an independent production and make in one day more than I make in a week being a PA. Mm-hmm. So you don't make that much money, but it's one of those things I think you more or less do it for the love of the craft. And the reason I really wanted to get into being a PA was not so much to make a career of it. You know, you know for a fact that I don't even keep up with my days. Yeah. To move up as a PA into the AD apartment or everything, you've got to log your days, keep track of your days, keep track of your call sheets, save all of them for every day. I don't do any of that because mm-hmm. I don't see myself moving up into the AD apartment because at my age, I'm not pushing for that as a career. But I like working on independent projects. I like building my own pet project. And that's the... And all honestly, that's the only reason I became a PA was to get firsthand knowledge of exactly how a set runs. Mm-hmm. So when I direct or produce my own music videos or commercials, which is what I want to really want to do, mm-hmm. which blows people's mind. When I talk to other PAs and they're like, so what do you want to do? You want to work on feature films? You want to work on TV shows? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? 
I'm like, I want to work in, I want to produce music videos and direct music videos and commercials. I don't care anything about being, I love movies, but you know, you can do a commercial in a week, mm -hmm. you know, max. Yeah. Sometimes you can blow a commercial out in two or three days. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of projects I would love. I'd love to have a production company where people come to me and go, hey, let's, and we are going to be doing a music video coming up, hopefully, if everything falls into place yeah. and doesn't fall apart. That's another thing, though, being a freelancer is one day the project has budget, the next day it's lost it. So, you know, that's even big budget films. Yeah. You know, one day they've got the money and the next day they don't. Somebody mm -hmm. pulls out. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's another thing that we go through. Yeah. It could be very frustrating at times, but you kind of have to just go with the flow and know that nothing's guaranteed and, like... Sometimes you'll have stuff, and then other times it'll just kind of dissipate and disappear. So, But you have that same experience, and you do your own projects as well. Yeah. And I think it makes us... It does. I'm not going to lie about it. It does. It makes us a step above anybody else. And there's tons of running gunners. There's thousands of running gunners out here in L.A. Mm -hmm. that are putting together their own little productions, and they've never been on a professional film set. Mm -hmm. So when you somebody calls us or calls them, I think we have a lot better, you know, we know how things are really supposed to work. Mm -hmm. And we can really structure things to put a crew together depending on what their budget is. Yeah. Instead of just, and that's the way I used to be. Just like I just try to, hey, man, you want to help me on this thing? You know what I mean? That kind of thing with people with no experience. So you just have a bunch of people up there standing around because nobody knows what to do. Mm -hmm. Everybody's standing there looking at you, waiting for you to tell them what to do. And you're trying to watch the, you know, watch your talent, make sure your talent's getting you know what you know what you need mm -hmm. and you know the last the last music video i directed that was a big thing is because i just didn't have any support crew mm -hmm. it was me uh, i had my camera guy who had worked on other music videos but he's working the camera yeah. you know what i mean he can't be in charge of creativity or you know so i was just trying to do it all mm -hmm. and now i'm at a position that hey i have enough people that i know that if somebody said, "Hey, Rav, I need a music video done. I've got sixty thousand dollars. Can you put? Can you put a? Mi of course, I can produce it. Yeah. I can write it. We can do everything. That's awesome. We can do turnkey, whatever you need. Yeah, being comfortable in that yeah. role. We talked about these two questions, so I'm kind of breeze over them quickly. How do I get into the business? You talked about there's multiple ways, multiple revenues. Um, how many hours do you work a day? You mentioned it's pretty much a minimum of ten. Um, but an average day is about 14 hours. Yeah. I have similar experience with that. I would definitely say yeah, that's true. Um, if you get off before 12 hours, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, I get a little bonus. <laughs> if you ever get off when it's still daylight outside, you feel like it's an anomaly. Like mm -hmm. you're just kind of walking around, looking around, just like baffled and amazed. Yeah. Because <laughs> usually when you do get on a production, even as a day player, you'll be back and working on, you know, four. My experience is, you know, like I'll work a day here maybe, but then I'll get like a four or five day. I've had like two or three weeks stretch where I'm there every single day. You know, mm -hmm. a PA's gone for a family funeral or they're gone to visit family or you're covering for somebody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're gone. So you fill in that spot yeah. until they come back. Yeah. Yeah. Never know. And those situations happen all the time yeah. and, you know, people come in and out and stuff. So. And that's, you know, when I worked on a Horror Story this last season, was it Horror Story or 911? Uh, the BGPA, Eric, he went back to New York and he had asked me, no, it was 911, because he had asked me on Horror Story because we were on Horror Story together. And he said, Hey, Rav, I'm going to be, we're going to 911 and I'm going to be going on vacation like the first week. Can you cover for me? I'm like, Yeah, sure, no problem, man. And so you come in, I came in at the first of that production. So all the day players thought I was the, they thought I was the staff BGPA. Oh wow! You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I didn't never tell them any different. It was no reason to. Yeah. But then we would work, 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 and I remember the last day Eric was going to be back. He was gone for like a week or two weeks, and he was going to be back. And the day player PAs were very confused because mm. I wasn't on the call sheet, and they were asking me questions about tomorrow. And I'm like, Oh, I don't know. Eric will be back tomorrow. And they're like, What? They were completely thrown for. <laughs> they were completely thrown off because I was I was leaving. I was not yeah. going to be back. And it's one of the other things of being a day player is you just step off because mm -hmm. you're you're gone you know yeah. some the the staff pa is coming back to get their and it's their job that's their job yeah. it's their position At the abby singer of questions here i've got two left that means i'm two shots left yeah, yeah. <laughs> um do you have a biggest regret or, or something specific to the industry 
I don't have any regrets in the industry. I wish I could have gotten in more like at your age, because then I probably would have. I could be a director by now. I could be a famous director by now. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not. I mean, that sounds gonna. It's still, there's yeah. still time. <laughs> no, nah, I'm too old. But you know, if I would have got in. Because I was dreaming of coming to L.A. when I was in high school. Oh, wow. And, you know, I ended up getting married and moving to Dallas and that kind of thing. But the marriage thing hadn't happened, which I would never, I wouldn't change anything. But I could have been, you know, working for years already. And my, I think my career would be a lot further advanced than what it is now. And I probably would just be in the film industry. Because if, I'm at the point now in my life and career to where I don't want to be a slave to production. I look around when I'm on a set and I look at people that's been doing this since the, even directors that have been doing this since the nineties. I worked with a director. She was almost in her seventies. I think she is like the, she was like the director on Ally McBeal, which that was a long time ago. And, and it's a lot of hours, man. You're putting in a lot, a lot of hours. So I'm at that point now. Well, that's why I love day playing. Mm -hmm. Cause if I can go in and make, if I can make, a week's worth of wages, I'm good. I'm pretty good. I'm set. You know what I mean? And then doing a little, a few things here and there independently. Mm -hmm. You know, that's enough for me. I'd rather work a week to a week and a half than a whole month of 15 hour days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I'm not that, down. I'm not that money hungry anymore. And <laughs> I haven't, you know, and then, but the, on the flip side of that, if I had, I probably have a big house. Mm -hmm. I'd have a huge mortgage, mm -hmm. you know, because every house here is a million dollars. Yeah. And then you so got to keep least, up. Yeah. So you got to keep yeah. up with that and you're buying all these cars. So who knows? Mm -hmm. What do you think your favorite thing is about the film industry? The people that I come in contact with, like you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> people, true, the people yeah. that I meet. Yeah, because you yeah. really do become family, you know, uh, because you're spending so much time. I mean, it's like a family because mm -hmm. you're married to people, basically. You know, I mean, there's people that have been doing this for years. and But when you're on a set... Uh, for any length of time, even if even if it's two or three months, you're with those people on set more than you're with your spouse yeah. or your loved ones. So it's it's the people, you know. I mean, I've met a lot of really cool people, and that's one thing I love about the film industry is because it's kind of like a family. If you're in, you're in. It's like it's like a motorcycle club. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you're in, you're in, and it doesn't matter what production you get thrown into. You'll walk on and you'll usually see at least one or two people that you know from another production. Yeah. So you always usually have a friend. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, Bird, like Beard's one of the guys I always see. He's an AV guy and, uh, you know, I'll, I've seen him on several different things. And it's just always cool to, like, come back around and see people. And that's another thing is, like, how you find jobs is from who you know. It's word of mouth. There's no recruiting center out there. There's no, like right now I have absolutely nothing booked. There's no place really for me to go try to find a production to get on. There's all kinds of things happening, but really what I'm doing is just sitting and waiting. Mm -hmm. Or I'll put out a feeler, I'll text some people and go, hey man, what are you working on? Are you guys, guys need any additionals? Oh yeah, I forgot about you, Rav. I'll, I'll talk to my second and make sure you're on the list. That's how you get work in this industry. It's not, it's completely unorthodox when it comes to any kind of other profession in the world. You know, mm -hmm. everybody else has like some kind of go to system that they can go to where they can pretty much know they're going to get work. And being a freelance production assistant or anything, yeah, I don't think, I think anything. If you're a camera operator, anything. If you're unemployed, you're just hoping that a production calls you mm -hmm. or somebody thinks of you or, you know, you always got to keep your, name fresh in people's minds mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. you got to touch base with people and let them know that you're available yeah absolutely that's a big key to yeah. keeping the momentum keeping the ball moving for you and and work wise so hey rab thanks for being on the show dude that was thanks a lot for of fun me, man. <laughs> um rab also has a really awesome youtube channel he'll, he'll plug it right here and tell you a little about it yeah it's called vagabond days i actually live in my vintage 1982 dodge camper van and uh, you can check it out at Vagabond Days, and that's with one D. It's V-A-G-A-D-A-Z-E. It's a fun channel. I've been following it for a while. He's gone to Texas and done a couple other trips. Um, so it's a fun show about RV life, if you've ever thought about living in um, campers or vans or anything like that. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Hey, guys, thanks for watching Hacking Hollywood. If you have any more questions, as always, please leave a comment below, um, and we would love to address those things, learning about... Um, the Hollywood industry and applying that knowledge to smaller productions. Um, thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.